All right, so we've been going through the story of all the kings in Israel, uh, uh, kings of Israel and Judah in Israel and the prophets. Uh, I'm going to bring up the chart I've been showing you, and we've been working our way through just to catch you up and help you plug things down in the historical context. If you remember a couple weeks ago, Ahaziah was the king of Judah. Ahaziah was killed by Jehu who became the king of Israel, the other country in the north. So remember, we've got Israel in the north, Judah in the south. It divided right after Solomon into two separate kingdoms. Both God's people, at least on paper, but they weren't living like it. Ahaziah was wicked, and the then king of Israel, Ahab, was wicked. And then he was replaced by, I forget what's his name, Joram or somebody, and he was wicked. So God said, that's it, kill them both. So Jehu took over in Israel. After he killed Ahaziah, Ahaziah's mom became queen of Israel. That wasn't allowed. So she killed all the boys to make sure nobody would take her place. But one of them was rescued by, her, by his aunt, hidden in the temple for seven years. And then the king, I mean the priest, put him on the throne and had her executed. Jehu was replaced by Jehoahaz. He was evil. But there's something I want to tell you about Jehoahaz. He worshipped idols, just like his dad did. He was evil, led the nation in evil. But they were sorely oppressed that in desperation they turned to God and said, Would you please help us? And you know what God said? He said, You're bad people. You're getting what you deserve. No, he didn't. He said, Yeah, I'll help. These are the people who have turned their backs on him, worshiping idols, and while they're worshiping idols, they ask God for help, and God says, okay, I'll help. You know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of parents. We have difficult children. They don't always do what we want, and yet they ask for something, and we give it to them because we love them. That's all there is to it. We just love them. So while Jehoahaz, son of Jehu, is king of Israel, Joash, who was raised by Jehoiada the priest, is king of Judah. Joash dies, his son Amaziah becomes king of Judah, and he was just like his dad. Walked with God for a little while, then turned his back on God and worshipped idols, just like Joash did, like father, like son. Power of influence. Meanwhile, while Amaziah is king of Judah, we've got Jehoash as king of Israel after Jehoahaz. Jehoash went to war with Amaziah, defeated Amaziah, raided the temple. Man, this is crazy stuff. Captured Amaziah, and then he dies, and Jeroboam becomes king. Now, I know you've heard the name Jeroboam before because he was the first king of Israel. Now, this guy is named after him, so he's called Jeroboam II. Let's see what the Bible says about Jeroboam II. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn away from any of the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, Jeroboam I. He did not turn away from those sins which he had caused Israel to commit. And the Lord had seen how bitterly everyone in Israel, whether slave or free, was suffering, and there was no one to help them. And since the Lord had not said he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, son of Jehoash. I don't know what grabs your attention when you read Scripture. I know everybody focuses in on a little something different, depending on what God's doing in their life. But let me tell you what grabbed my attention here. Between Jehoahaz and Jeroboam, something grabbed my attention. Jeroboam and Israel were doing evil, and yet God saved Israel through Jeroboam and gave them social and financial prosperity, military victory. Jehoahaz and the people were evil, and they cried out to God for help, and God blessed them. So here's what grabs my attention. There are wicked, evil people, and God blesses them. Have you ever thought that about God? God blesses people that even despise him. We don't do that. He loves everybody, even people that don't love him. God loves people. Even bad people, even mean people, 
even atheists. God loves atheists. This is, I'm sorry, this is weird from our experience, from our perspective. We don't work that way. So somebody's wrong. And I don't think it's God. Listen to what Yeshua said, Jesus. He causes his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Sun, rain, harvest. You're a farmer. Over here is a good farmer. Over here is a bad farmer. The rain falls on both fields, doesn't it? God doesn't say, oh, you're a bad person, so I'm not going to let your field get rain. He gives them rain. When you live in Israel, you've got to have rain. It's a desert, like here. You know rain, no crops. But God gives crops to wicked people. He, that's not an accident. It's not, well, God can't make the rain go to one half of the street and not the other. He does it on purpose. It's willful. It's not even that he set the weather in motion and it runs. No, he willfully causes the wicked farmer to have a blessed crop. It's intentional because God is good. Maybe you won't want to put up your hands for this because I'm going to make fun of you if you do. But I'm going to put up my hand. How often or how many of you have ever asked in an offended way, why does God let wicked people prosper? Why does that wicked guy have so much money, so many good looks, so many everything? Yeah, it's natural. It's not fair. Why do we ask that question? Why does it bother us that bad people are blessed? Because God is blessing them. God's doing it on purpose. Well, I'll tell you why it bothers us. Because we don't love like God loves. God loves them. We don't. And like I said before, somebody's wrong. Yeshua had 12 real close disciples. He named them apostles and gave them special missions. But amongst them, he had three that were really close, Peter, James, and John. This is what John said. It's written down in the Bible. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. What's good for the goose is good for the gander, if you've ever heard that saying. God just doesn't tell us to love one another just out of thin air. He wants us to be like him. He loves us, and he wants us to love one another. He loves all his children, so he wants us to love our siblings, not just the fun ones, not just the nice ones, but all of them. Here's what Yeshua said. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who mistreat you. Really? Maybe that's a bad translation. <laughs> well, Israel was worshiping idols. They were hating and despising God, and God was blessing them. So I think that's a pretty good translation. He's telling us to do exactly what he's done over all the centuries with those who have despised him. God's basically saying, treat people like I treat them, which is love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who mistreat you. You know, if I was into this for the religion, I'd pick a different one. Because that just rubs me wrong every which way. But because I'm not into it for the religion, I'm into it because it's the truth, and God has told me that this is the truth, and he has sent a Savior to die for my sins and shown me this is the truth. The fact that this rubs me the wrong way rubs me the wrong way. <laughs> this shouldn't rub me the wrong way, but it does, and that means everything he says about me is true in the book. So I need to love my enemies more than I do. And I need to love people who hate me more than I do. And I need not to regret that like I do. Ah, 
I'm just starting. Every time it's a new lesson. So the title of today's lesson is How to Treat Mean People. And I think I just answered the whole title. How do we treat mean people? As loving as possible. And I'm going to say as possible because none of us are where God is on this. Here's the bar, and here's where we're at. And here's where I'm at. Okay, I'll get there someday. But that's not the bar, that's the bar. So I've got to make sure that I'm striving without getting so frustrated with myself that I quit. And I'm saying this for you too. We've got to strive. We're not there. This side of heaven, we won't get there. But journey's half the fun. We do what we can to get there. So, Yeshua told us to love our enemies. And in that context, he said a lot more. Listen to what he said. If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other. This passage is used by a lot of people to promote the concept of biblical pacifism. That God says we shouldn't defend ourselves. I don't see it that way, because this isn't a matter of self-defense. Somebody striking you on the cheek isn't somebody trying to kill you. It's just, see, in that culture, even in this culture, sometimes people get slapped, right? What's a slap? Is that a challenge to your life, to your safety, to your family? No, it's an insult. It's an expression of disgust and anger on their part and an insult when it connects with your cheek. Because you know what? Slapping doesn't really hurt. Yeah, it stings a little, but so what? It's not that big a deal. It's not like getting hit upside the head with a baseball bat. It's a different matter altogether. So Jesus said, hey, somebody slaps you, they insult your dignity. Deal with it. Like a big boy speaking to me. Get over it. You're not dead, you'll live didn't even hurt. It's not about self-defense. It's about dignity and insult. By the way, when Yeshua said, turn the other cheek, he practiced what he preached. Listen. The high priest questioned Yeshua about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Yeshua replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where everybody, all the Jewish people came together. I didn't say anything in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. They know what I said. And when Yeshua said this, one of the officials nearby struck him in the face. Pap, is that the way you answer the high priest? If I said something wrong, testify as to what is wrong. If I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Is that how you talk to the high priest? Is that how you treat God in human flesh? I smite thee, and a bolt of lightning comes down and vaporizes him on the spot. Didn't happen. It was a worm compared to a god, and the worm struck the god. And what did the god do? Turn the other cheek. It's not about anything other than, for us, self-control, patience, forgiveness, forbearance, long-suffering. We argue about the piece of it that deals with self-defense. We're missing the whole point. This is, this is all about love and patience and kindness and goodness. Well, that wasn't the only detail he gave on how to treat mean people. If they slap you, they call you a name, they give you the middle finger, they say a bad word in your face, how do you respond? You don't. You turn the other cheek. In our culture, there's not so many slaps. But man, there's the finger, there's the bad words. Turn the other cheek. You can... Yell back, no, you can't. Turn the other cheek. But what they said about my mama, don't worry about it. You should have heard what they said about his father. Deal with it. He said if you lend something to someone, it's better to let them keep it than to fight to get it back. It's the principle of the thing, it's mine. It was yours, it's not anymore. But that's not right. 
No, it's not right. But I'll tell you what's even worse, fighting to get it back. That's even more of a wrong. That, does, that doesn't strike me as right, people. I don't like that kind of fair justice play. If it's mine, I'm getting it back. That's wrong, Mr. Shermet. Here's what he said. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. So, somebody came up to me the other day and said, can I have that book back I, I loaned to you? I said, what book? I don't remember you lending me a book. He said, yeah, I gave, I gave you this book, and I need it back now. I said, well, uh, I don't remember it, but I'll just go buy you a new one. He said, no, you don't want to say that. I said, why? Is it a $50 book or something? He said, no, it's a $100 book. I, I said, listen, if you gave me the book, I'll get you a new book. It's not right. He said, no, don't worry about it. We're both doing what we think Yeshua would have us do. We both think the other one's wrong, and neither of us care. We just want to please the other person. So I'm going to go get him another book. Fortunately, I found it for a lot less than $100. <laughs> but I was ready to go, man. <laughs> Yeshua said we shouldn't fight to get things, and we shouldn't fight to keep things. If someone sues you to take your cloak, do not stop him from taking your tunic also. But it's not fair. No, it's got nothing to do with fair. It's got to, love comes first, fair comes second. Yes, fair is important. That means treat everybody as fairly as you possibly can. But when they don't treat you fairly, love comes first. That's what Yeshua is saying. Love trumps everything. It's the number one rule. Amen. If someone sues you to take your cloak, don't stop him from taking your tunic. Man, this is hard. I, I, I agree, this is hard. I don't like it just means that I'm not there yet. This is hard. Three words. This is love. Three words. Sometimes we see, don't sue, turn the other cheek, don't do this, don't, and we analyze it as a, as a list of rules. And I'll tell you, people come up to me right after my sermon and say, Steve, does that mean I have to do this? Throw away the rules. It's not about the rules. It's about the principle the rules are trying to draw us toward. Love. Love comes first. So don't come up afterwards and ask me about the fight you're having with so-and-so and what your job is. Because my answer is going to be simple. Pursue love. That'll be my, my answer. So I'm giving it to you now. I don't care what the situation is. Pursue love. That's it. That's my answer. That was Yeshua's answer. You know, somebody came to him about a fight over inheritance. And he said, who made me an arbiter of your disputes over inheritance? He said, just beware of covetousness. That was his answer. Wow. Then he said, do to others as you'd have them do to you. Now, those words were very familiar in that culture because there was a famous rabbi named Hillel who had a saying just like it. Don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you. Very similar. Hillel said, don't do. Yeshua said, do. Don't do versus do. Big difference. Not doing something for somebody is, is neutral. Doing something for somebody is positive. It's not enough that we don't retaliate. He didn't say ignore those who are mean to you. He said bless them and do good to them. He didn't just say ignore them and... and cut them out of your life. He said, bless them. It's a positive thing. Do to others what you would have others do to you. Not the one I used to prefer. Do unto others as they have done unto you. That used to be my bumper sticker, figuratively speaking, but not anymore. If you love those who love you, our Messiah said, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. If you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? 
even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Just like it said here. Give to everyone who asks, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. That's what he's talking about. I tell you what, I don't lend money. On those rare occasions when somebody asks, if I have it, I'll give it to them. If I don't, I'll say, sorry, I can't afford it. But I don't lend. Because lending just leads to problems. Oh, I promise I'll give it back. It's a gift. Keep it. No, I swear I'll give it back. Listen, it's a gift. Then if that day comes where they can't give it back, they don't have to be afraid to look me in the eye. They don't have to feel like our relationship is ruined because they know, I know that they owe me and they can't pay me back. None of that. If you can't afford it, don't give it. If you can't afford it, just give it, no strings attached. If you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them. And let, lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High. Because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Then your reward will be great. So my wife's employer, which is a big corporation, recently changed their retirement account handler. A whole new corporation runs the retirement account now. So we went and sat down with one, one of the representatives so we could understand everything. And this representative was trying to get us to transfer other accounts over to them, because obviously that's good for their business. But she didn't have much of a carrot. She said, you know, we'd love to take your other accounts, but can't offer you much. We're paying half a percent interest. <laughs> and she was almost embarrassed to say so. I don't blame her. The economy is horrible. There's no incentive to put my money over there, half a percent of interest. I'll do better sticking in the sock drawer. I have talked to people who have more money than you can dream of possible. And in this economy, they don't know what to do with it. I mean, they know how to invest money. That's why they're rich. But in this economy, they're clueless. They don't know what to do with this money. Then your reward will be great. Let me tell you about God's economy. There's no recession in heaven. The good deeds that we do on this earth will come back to you by the bucket load in the afterlife. Don't worry about giving somebody 50 bucks and never seeing it again. Because when you get to heaven, you're going to get a wheelbarrow full of diamonds in response, figuratively speaking. It's a great investment. Don't worry about it. You know? Who wouldn't give a banker 10 bucks if they said next month I'll give you 100? Y'all would. It's a great investment. Well, I'm telling you, forget about that investment. Invest in heaven. Don't worry about your 401k as much as you worry about your we should come up with a really cool terminology for our afterlife fund. I don't know. The 77K. 777K fund. Then your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Just like John said, his apostle, I read it to you before. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So I want to give you both a Jewish guilt trip and the opposite of a Jewish guilt trip. And I don't even know the words for that. Maybe if I wasn't Jewish, I'd know. <laughs> a little relief. Here's the guilt trip. We are so far off from what God wants us to be. You've seen the standard. It's up here. Here's the basement. And I think we're right about here. But that's good because we used to be sub-basement. We need to raise the standard, people. Our number one mission in life must be love. And if it don't hurt, it ain't love. There's the guilt trip. Let me come on over here. Ugh. God loves you. God has forgiven you all your sins. 
God cannot wait to take you to heaven and reward you handsomely. And I told you, here's you. Here's how he sees you. Just as he sees Yeshua. The scripture says, He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He swapped spiritual places with us. What we need to do is turn from our sin and give our lives to Yeshua.